And now the moment you've all been waiting for. That's this week on Motoring 2000. SN's Motoring 2000 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them, and Midas Car Care, the way it should be. This week we're in the parking lot of the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto, and as you can see, this is where Graham Fletcher conducts his skid pad and brake test each week on test drive. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 2000. Now this week, this parking lot is the location for our annual Car of the Year special. Things are a little different this year. We don't have the tuxedos on and we're going to dip into the past to unveil our overall Car of the Year for 2000. Now you might be old enough to remember back when manufacturers used to advertise their new models by putting a cover over them to help generate excitement. Well, what goes around comes around. And our Car of the Year for 2000 this year is also under wraps. Nothing fancy, just your average car cover, but it will do. And later, the lovely Cadia Miss Swimsuit for the year 2000 will pull the wraps off our lucky winner. But first, Graham will be joining me in just a moment, but let's go back to the year 1987, the first year of motoring, and check out the young Graham Fletcher. This week's pet peeve is now I've finished with my fun, I've got to go and watch this thing. But seriously, to get anything out of the back, you have to wind the window down. When it's all the way down, unlock it, and release the handle. In winter, can you imagine when the lock is frozen and the glass is frozen in the channel? You're never going to get anything out. Anyway, that aside, let's Ah oh, yes, the good old days. That was when I had a few more teeth and a lot more hair, but down to business. We've taken the most significant cars from the past year and lumped them into a number of different categories. Up first, the economy class of 2000. We've already acknowledged the value the Accent brings to the economy car market. The newest edition reaffirms its status as one of the best buys. While not the most technologically advanced, it combines affordability with an honest work ethic that's better than most. Ford's Focus signals a new direction boasting power refinement and considering the cost, one of the better suspensions offered. The interior is well thought through and the overall looks quite sharp. In short, a worthy contender regardless of competition. The new Echo is a car destined to redefine the economy car market. The exterior dimensions are minimal, the interior space and packaging anything but. It also brings a level of technology unprecedented in this category. It is without question the new benchmark and therefore our economy car of the year. Well, the Echo is a worthy winner, although you couldn't go wrong with any one of those three cars. And even though they're called small cars, the manufacturers have done a terrific job in stretching the interior, and you really get a bang for the buck, man. Absolutely. Because you buy an economy car doesn't mean you're buying a cheap car any longer. However, if you need to shop above those vehicles but below $25,000, there really wasn't that much new this year. However, you can't go wrong with vehicles like the Volkswagen Jetta, Subaru Impreza, or even the Chevrolet Malibu. It's an honest car for an affordable dollar. However, our next category, family sedans over 25,000. With the Chevy Lumina getting a little long in the tooth, GM needed a replacement. Enter the new Impala. While playing on the history of the nameplate, the new flagship delivers big car comfort, good road manners, and performance in an honest package that's priced to sell. The Nissan Maxima has always been a very capable car, one that could be used as a sports car or as a family mule. The latest edition reaffirms its family persona whilst adding to the sport side. With 222 horsepower, a better suspension and a different, if still rather staid look, Maxima should continue its winning ways. The launch of the LS2 gives Saturn dealers a car to get their teeth into. It delivers room, performance and affordability in a package that has a familiar but distinctive look. 
The up-level LS2 and its V6 is a combination capable of running with any of its immediate competition. The winner of that category is, without question, the Nissan Maxima. Should you get that brand new car of yours rust-proofed? Well, 10 years ago, that was a slam dunk. Of course you did. Cars were engineered for Southern California, not Southern Alberta or Southern Ontario. But advances in metals technology have made that process largely irrelevant. Most cars today are built completely or partially anyway out of galvanized steel, which is practically impervious to rust. Additional rust proofing techniques are applied right at the factory. Besides, your car body's been optimized for weight and strength. Do you really want some grade 10 dropout attacking it with a drill, punching it full of holes? I don't think so. But if you do feel the need for aftermarket rust proofing, try to avoid those $500 deals your dealer will try to sell you. Find a local shop that will spray it, preferably with an aircraft quality liquid. It'll seep into the nooks and crannies and provide extra protection. No drilling, and it shouldn't cost you more than $100. Remember, too, all of these processes have to be repeated at least once a year. Three to $700 isn't uh, out of the ordinary for one of these sensors. They can be pretty pricey. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. What? What's the matter? That was probably what? one of the best you've done in well, the best out. first takes. First takes. That's why they call first. me One Take Bill. Wow. Didn't you see the Actor Awards the other day and they were. That was great. Best performance by an auto mechanic in a TV show. There is only one, so the award goes to. Well, it's under wraps right now, but in a little while, Caddy and Miss Swimsuit 2000 will unveil Motoring's overall car of the year. But right now, let's check out our nominees for a luxury sedan to be followed by Prestige. The new LeSabre blends traditional Buick values with a good dose of modern day thinking. While still very conservative, it delivers bulletproof power and all the amenities you expect in a luxury car, except perhaps a slightly firmer suspension. The new i30 brings better ride and handling dynamics, a fresh look that adds some much needed character and a very willing 227 horsepower. It also gives those to whom it matters an upscale key fob for the golf club. To say the Lincoln LS is the best handling Ford takes a little believing. That is until you push it through a fast corner. It is clear that the LS benefited greatly from its association with the S-Type Jag. Add to the manners, a trim body and a nicely appointed interior and you have our luxury sedan of the year. The new A6 brings to the party the item its predecessor lacked and simply stated that was power. A new 2.7 litre twin turbo delivers 250 horses while a new V8 pumps the production to an even 300 and more importantly 295 pounds feet of torque at just 3000 RPM. Quattro drive is, of course, standard. To suggest that the new DeVille represents a quantum leap forward is to understate the significance of the rework. It now has a suspension that's capable of keeping up with the engine, an interior design that's almost modern. Now, if only the exterior could catch up with the rest of the car. When Jaguar decided to launch a car based on a Lincoln, one had to wonder. But thankfully, it was developed with a separate venture sharing little but the core structure. It is, as a result, every inch a Jag. From the look to the feel, the S-Type is one class act, one good enough to win our prestige car of the year. Two very different categories, two very different cars, but they do have one thing in common, and that's the platform. It just goes to show you that platform engineering is not such a bad thing if it's done properly. Anyway, now to our next category, a group of vehicles that seems to be making a comeback, and that's the good old station wagon. The new Focus will serve Ford very well, delivering all the right characteristics. It's modern to the look, peppy to the feel, and with 1,062 litres of cargo space, it delivers big car cargo capacity in a city-friendly package. The Elantra wagon continues to specialise in affordability. A new VE model brings up-level equipment at an everyday price. It also uses its versatility card well, delivering 915 litres of space with the seats up, and a class topping 1784 with them folded flat. The Legacy is no stranger to awards, having won more than probably any other single model. 
the new car delivers the best all-wheel drive system available and a more powerful engine, a combination that continues the winning ways as it picks up our best new station wagon award. Our Midas tip of the week concerns maintaining your car's finish. Since this is the car of the year show and we're talking about looking after that brand new car you may be purchasing, we thought we'd talk about the finish because that's one of the most important areas in keeping your car looking good for a long period of time. Now waxing a brand new car is not all that gratifying because you've got a glossy, shiny look to start with. When you're finished waxing it, it doesn't look a whole lot better than when you started. But it's going to make a huge difference to the finish of that car four, five, and six years down the road if you wax it at least once a year. There's a blemish on the paint of this car that's probably going to be permanent. You can see that the bird droppings left a mark here that's going to be really hard to get out and it may not come out at all. Now if there'd been a good coat of cake paste wax on this car prior to the bird droppings getting on there, in all likelihood that mark wouldn't have been uh, left there. Now cake paste wax like this one is by far your best product. It's the toughest stuff to put on and to buff back off. It takes a lot of elbow grease, but it does far and away the best job. Your second best choice is a liquid wax, and I guess your third choice would be the wax that they install at the car wash. It's better than nothing, but it's not to be compared with a job done with this cake paste wax. Now if you've got an older car and you want to bring the finish back to a high luster before you put the wax on to protect it, the pre-wax cleaner is the way to go. It takes off all the, the oxidized paint and minor blemishes like this disappear, then you follow up with the wax to protect the finish. Now, putting on cake paste wax is a lot of work. There's a lot of elbow grease required. It's real gratifying on a car that's a couple years old, and it'll make a big difference on a brand new car two and three years down the road. That's your Midas tip of the week. One question you may have regarding your new car purchase is, should you go for the extended warranty? Well, first understand, that extended warranties are not warranties at all, they're insurance policies. You pay a little premium now in the hopes of avoiding big payouts down the road. I also understand that nobody knows better than your car maker how much it's going to cost to repair your car after the regular warranty has expired. The insurance companies that underline these schemes also have this information and they're not going to charge you a premium that will prevent them from making a profit. So on average, you're going to spend more for the premium than you will for the repairs down the road. Also, when you're shopping, make sure you find out exactly what is and what is not covered. Personally, I wouldn't pay for the extended warranty, but if you're the sort that likes to wear both belt and suspenders and want to limit the maximum possible exposure to your expenses down the road, well, maybe the extended warranty will give you a little additional peace of mind. The other thing is the gear lever. This thing has got more play when it's in gear than most manual transmissions have when they're new neutral. The new, 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 new neutral. Well, our overall car of the year is still under wraps, and in a few moments, Cadia Miss Swimsuit 2000 will unveil our lucky winner. But it's now time to head to the garage and join Bill. But before we do, let's once again go back to Motoring 88 and remember the young Bill Gardner. All these things we've looked at this week are preventive maintenance. We're trying to catch problems before they develop into costly repairs. Next week, we're going to look closely at belts and hoses. Until then, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 88. Well, Brad, other than all that weight I've lost recently, I don't see a whole lot of difference between then and now. Do you? Come on. Anyhow, we've got a couple of letters this week that are sort of uh, apropos your subject this week of new cars and car of the year. Two of our viewers are looking to more or less preserve their cars by not driving them in the wintertime. They're asking questions about winter storage. One is from a, a viewer, Jean-Michel in Montreal, and the other, Matthew McKenzie. They've both got cars that they want to sort of put away and avoid the worst part of the winter. And they're asking questions about storing them. So their biggest problem, and uh, Matthew alludes to it in his letter, he says, my car has four-wheel disc brakes, and I've heard that these types of brakes are, when not used for extended periods of time, they're, they're going to seize up. Well, that's certainly correct. That's where your biggest problem is going to be. Now, both these fellows are talking about storing their car in a carport. So the car has a, you know, a roof over it, but it's basically exposed to the elements, and they're going to have problems if they store their cars for an extended period of time like that. I'd strongly recommend that they think about putting them in a garage. The biggest problem area is going to be right here in the brakes. Now, you can see that the brake rotor, this area inboard of the brake pads where the brake pads don't touch, 
rust terribly. That's a normal condition, but this area out here where the brake pads normally sweep the rotor and scrub it clean, you can see on our Grand Prix, because it's been parked for a couple of weeks, there's a rusty brown haze here. Now this will scrub away as the car's driven, and then the rest of the rotor will end up looking like that, that good spot right there. It will scrub away this brown haze, but if, if our viewers park their cars for an extended period of time, like all winter, they're going to have the rotor in terrible shape when they start out in the spring and they're going to have some terrible chattering and noises and uh, a terrible feel to the brakes and they'll probably have to either resurface or replace the rotor. And on modern cars, the difference between the nominal thickness, in other words the thickness of a brand new rotor and the thickness that you're allowed to machine it down to is pretty minimal so you don't have a whole lot of room to clean these up on a brake lathe and resurface them. I strongly suggest that these two viewers or anybody else that's thinking about preserving their car get that thing inside a garage and drive it once a month when you've got a clear dry day. Take it out and run it a little bit, drive it around, that'll do a heck of a lot for keeping your brake system in check and if you can't do that as an option to that, think about getting heated indoor storage. Then you can literally walk away from it for quite some time. There are other things you have to do to the engine and electrical system, of course, to make sure your battery doesn't drain. But your biggest problem will be in the area of the brakes, as our viewers alluded to. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2000. A sad commentary on the state of the retail sales business in the car game is that it doesn't take much for the consumer to know more about the car he's shopping for than the sales rep who's trying to sell it. And you know, it's never been easier as more and more Canadians become net savvy. Well, of course, you still watch motoring for the definitive word on new cars, and you can read the newspaper sections and the motoring magazines. But with all these web pages out there, including motoring's web page, of course, there's all sorts of additional information. The car makers often have their own web pages, and in many cases, you can spec a car right there on the web. You can find out what options are available, exactly which options you want, and in some cases, you can even get the exact list price of exactly the car that you want before you enter the showroom. Remember, forewarned is forearmed. Well, it's time for my favorite part of the Car of the Year show as we take a look at the Sport Coupe category, followed by the Sport Sedans. The new TT is, for want of a better description, an upscale version of Volkswagen's Bug. It has a funky look, a decent engine, quattro all-wheel drive, and some of the best road manners offered in a sports car. It's also a very refreshing departure from Audi's rather staid norm. Back in the early days, Honda delivered a delightful chain-driven roadster. To usher in a new century, they've launched the S2000, a roadster in the truest sense. With 240 horses, a balanced feel, and classic lines, it's a barnstormer of the first order. There's been little to complain about the 3 Series over the years. It's always handled, was comfortable and carried itself with a poise not easily matched. The new model expands on these virtues by adding a superbly flexible 2.8 litre engine. By the slimmest of margins, our best new sports coupe goes to Honda's S2000. Take a very capable car and add a good dose of horsepower and you have the new S4. With a full-time all-wheel drive system and decidedly decent road manners, the S4 is a true sleeper. The complete lack of garish add-ons is a refreshing departure from the norm. The BMW M5 is a barnstormer of the first order. Not only is it blindingly quick, it is exceptionally refined. In town its demeanour is quiet and remarkably civilised. On the highway its 400 horses give the driver a very special reward one few cars are capable of duplicating. The E55 starts life as a stock E-Class sedan. After AMG have weaved their magic, it's one of the few cars that represents a true threat to the M5's dominance. With 349 horsepower on tap and a suspension that feels as though it's riding on rails, it is the epitome of a sports sedan. Six very worthy cars and two very close races. In the sports coupe, we picked the S2000 over the BMW 3 Series by a very small margin. In the sports sedan, again, the M5 edged the E55 in a very tight race. It's now time to slow things down as we go out into the backwards and look at our nominees for the best new sport utility. BMW's X5 charts virgin territory, delivering on the sporty part of the sport utility nameplate. A fast and furious 4.4 litre V8, decidedly good road manners, and a sophisticated all-wheel drive system combined to deliver utility in the fast lane. 
The Xterra brings a funky alternative to the typically conservative sport utility market. The look is rugged yet refined and the ride quality better than most. Combine this with a talky V6 and good off-road ability and you have a very serious player. Lauded as the Texas Cadillac, the Yukon XL delivers a ute that's larger than life. With a generous interior, powerful engine, decent off-road ability and tremendous towing capacity, it hauls our best new ute away in style. How can I choose a car that's going to be safe? Well, it's not an easy thing to do. First of all, all cars sold in Canada have to have passed the same... Safety standards. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you're rolling on that. We've come to that point in the program we've all been waiting for when we finally unveil our overall car of the year for the year 2000. But first, let's join Graham to review our finalists. Here's a quick run through of our cars of the year so far. In economy car, we picked the Toyota Echo. Vehicles over 25,000, the Nissan Maxima won yet again, as did Subaru Legacy in the station wagon category. Luxury sedan went to the Lincoln LS, and in the prestige car, it's kind of sibling the Jaguar S-Type. BMW's M5 picked up the sports sedan, while the Honda S2000 took the coupe category. In the sport youth, GMC's Yukon XL. And now, without further ado, drum roll please, and Katia, would you please take the cover off and reveal Motoring's Car of the Year for 2000. Motoring 2000's Car of the Year is the Toyota Echo. Not only is this car a small vehicle that gives you large car packaging, it sets a new benchmark that's going to be very difficult to surpass. Incidentally, before we go, we have one more unofficial car of the year, right Graham? Absolutely. The Echo we picked purely and simply because it sets a new benchmark and it was done with the head. If money were no object and I picked with my heart, it would be BMW's exquisite M5. There's nothing quite like sliding behind the wheel of that rocket. It's unbelievable. Incidentally, next year, along with maybe picking a warmer place to do this, I'll we're going to be asking that. you, the viewer, to help us select our overall winners via the Motoring 2000 webpage. Until then, stay tuned as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 2000 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas Car Care, the way it should be.